Hi guys, welcome back to Misty's channel. Thank you for clicking on my channel. Today we're gonna go over as much as I could really find about ADAPA. And then after that, we're going to try to tie some of the knowledge that we get from ADAPA and the Sumerian stele and tablets and see how they kind of do or don't match up with the Navajo creation story that we talked about in the last video. And then I wanna also share some information that I got from a member of the Kiowa tribe, not the Navajo tribe, but they are neighbors. And he kind of gave me some insight into what the coyotes really looked like in their legends. And I'm telling you, it's gonna freak you out. It freaked me out, but in a good way, cause man, this shit is just stuff to get up for in the morning. You know what I mean? Okay, so today, we're gonna talk about Adapa. The story that we're gonna talk about came from many different fragments of tablets. These fragments came from different time periods in Mesopotamian history, and there is no one surviving tablet that gives us all of it. In fact, there's no one surviving tablet that gives us the full story of anything. This is a time that is so ancient that, you know, we're lucky we even have what we have. The story that we're gonna talk about, that would include the Sumerian, the Babylonian, and the Akkadian perspective of this person and the legends tied to him. And some of these fragments came from Ashburnipal's library. What happened to his library is a darn shame, but because he had it, we still have some knowledge from the ancient past. Ashburnipal, we talked about when we did the video on tablet K358. And I think also he came up in the Egyptian ancient labyrinth video. But we also get some more information from a man named Barosis. Now Barosis was a Babylonian scholar who wrote down ancient obscure legends. Barosis was a scholar who wrote down his legends in Greek circa 280 BC. Now, when I say obscure, I don't mean like that like Adapa wasn't known to anybody. What I mean is that he wasn't known to many people and the people that did know of him I believe there was a very good reason. Like he wasn't shared knowledge with everyone, but I'll get to that later. Barosis writes of a frightening monster, one that comes from the Red Sea. The monster, he writes, is called Anuna. Barosis states the monster Anuna has the body of a fish and the head of a man, a human voice and the feet of a man. But he doesn't say much else about it. He just states that his name is Anuna and he is a monster and, and describes how this monster looks and sounds. Interestingly enough, we now know that this fish man was all over Mesopotamia and it wasn't a person, but he represented a class of people and this class was called the Ashapu. Adapa is a priest, a man with broad knowledge, a sage, also called an Ashapu in the Sumerian language. In fragments found, he is also called Uana Adapa, and scholars believe that he is also named in the tablets more frequently as Uana. When named as one of the seven sages in the tablet called the Uruk List of Kings and Sages, it states Uana, who perfectly designs the universe. Now, Uana Adapa is not a god or a man. He is a demigod at this point, at least until the flood. Adapa is thought to be a sage, which really means that he would have been considered an Ashapu in that time period. And an Ashapu is someone who works under the knowledge that came from the god Ea. Ea is the name that is later on given to who the Sumerians call Enki. So sometimes I'm going to say Uana or Dapa and just know both of those names correspond to the same person. And sometimes I may say Ea or Enki and just know that both of those correspond to who we have talked about before as Enki, one of the Anuna or Anunnaki. That's this thing that sucks with the changing of languages, right? They all have so many damn names. When you start to really look at them, you realize that there's not that many stories out there. It's the same story told over and over again. The names are different. Now, Ea was considered the god of magic and wisdom, and Ashaku, the one that has learned the broad knowledge of the god Ea, is a priest that deals with cleansing and purification rituals, as well as exorcism. Because Adapa is an Ashapu and a sage, he is denoted as half man, half fish, as was customary to denote a sage under the tutelage of the god Enki, who lived in the Abzu. I know it's getting tricky here, but basically they are some of the most knowledgeable people and they are advisors to the king and they have directly studied the knowledge of the god Enki. Adapa is from Eridu, and Eridu was once considered the oldest city on earth, and to many it still is. It is the first city mentioned in the Sumerian Kings list, and the first line of the Sumerian Kings list states, 
when kingship from heaven descended, the kingship was in Eridu. Eridu in Sumerian mythology was the home to Enki, the savior to all of humanity. His temple was called e Abzu, translated to House of the Deep Waters, and it is believed that Enki lived in the Abzu. The Abzu was the primeval sea below the void of space, that which from all fresh water is derived. Now, Adapa is a fisherman. He provides food for the gods, and because he's a fisherman, he is out on the sea most of the time. But he also travels to heaven. Basically, you would have found him in Eridu and the surrounding areas on his way to heaven or in the sea, but mostly in the sea. In the Uruk sage list, the one that I brought up earlier, it states that Adapa was sage to Alulim. Alulim is the first king of Eridu on the Sumerian kings list, and so Adapa is sage in the very beginning. The very beginning of time, even before time splits and becomes different. Now, when Adapa is in Eridu, he is sage to the king, and there were different kinds of knowledge. There were those with knowledge and there were those with broad understanding. Those with broad understanding had knowledge and had understanding of the rituals that went into so much of the ancient past. In order to construct a temple, a home, a palace, anything in an ancient Sumerian city, rituals were used to make sure that catastrophe did not ensue. In fact, the further back you go, the more it looks like all parts of life had rituals associated with it. And it's not just in Sumerian cities, right? Many different nations in the Americas had rituals that were associated to many things that they did, as well as the Egyptians. This is not anything new. Basically, in the ancient past, in the most layman ways possible, it may have looked like this. Incubate a dream or a thought that is to be in the future. Wake up, pray, cleanse your body, pray again. Perform a ritual that is associated with what you want to accomplish, pray again. Begin your project, probably pray again. Now remember this is a time when it is not exactly like it is now. In the Antediluvian Kings list, there are eight rulers that rule over a span of time that is around 241,000 years. Then the flood comes and it changes, but still people live much longer than they do today. If you look at the Sumerian Kings list and other records from ancient past. A good king needs a good sage, and Adapa is a sage to Enmerkar. Enmerkar is the second ruler of Uruk. He reigns for 420 years, and his father was the first ruler of Uruk, and is known as Meshkiang Gashur, the king who entered the sea and disappeared. So, this is weird, right? Adapa is sage to the first ruler in the first city, and then is still the sage to the king and Merkar in the third city that kingship is bestowed. So just to put some stuff in perspective, I'm gonna go over a different tablet, one that is not really about Adapa. It's Gilgamesh, Enkidu, in the Netherworld. I'm just gonna read the Sumerian part of a passage. It's called Uriya U Sudra Ria, Gira Gibadra Griya. Muria Mu Sudra Ria. Now this translates to, in those days, in those distant days, on those nights, in those distant nights, in those years, in those distant years. This is when those necessary things have been brought into manifest existence. In the days of yore, when the necessary had been cared for, when the heaven had been separated from the earth. This is the time when he claimed the heavens for himself. Anu, and when Enlil had claimed the earth for himself. With those far off years since the years had been finishing, after the flood swept over, establishing the chaos of the land, after the humanity had been blank to dust, after the lands from below and above had been run together, the Anuna of heaven and earth, many there were, had no meals or dining room. This was the once upon a time, if you will. Now, this was gone over to show that there was a new division of time. Like, I don't know, maybe a new expression of time. There was the primordial time, the midpoint time, and then there is this time. Primordial time is before the flood and we are now living in this time, so I don't have to go over that, right? Midpoint time is very far off from the time of creation. I think that's what they were trying to say there. This was a time long, long, long ago. Now on to Adapa. I just had to get that out there so that we can maybe better understand the rest of the video. So Adapa or Uana, he pops up many times in many tablets throughout time, but just barely. It's like a little pop here and a pop there, but nothing really specifically about him except for just a few. So let's go over those few. There's one tablet and it's called Adapa and Enmerkar. It is extremely fragmented and it basically states that Adapa and Enmerkar travel deep into the sea and retrieve an ancient corpse of the remotest times. 
and then that's it. Okay, and then we have Adapa in the South Wind. This is the one that he is most famous from. This myth is mostly from Ashburnipal's library. It is also quite fragmentary, but basically it goes like this. This is a time period immediately after the flood, that middle point in time. The flood has decimated everything. Humanity and the animals that walk upon the earth are all almost gone. At this point, kingship is reestablished in Kish. So it's like the second part of the Sumerian kings list. Because the second line of the kings list says, after the flood passed over, the kingship descended to Kish. And this is a point where it states that humanity is without a guide. And Adapa is fishing on the sea to feed Enki. As he is fishing, the south wind blows and it blows over his boat, overturning, throwing him into the water. Adapa is enraged. And with his magical knowledge and incantations, he curses the wind and he screams, I will break your wing. The wind doesn't blow for seven days and Anu takes notice of this. Anu asks his vizier what happened to the south wind. His vizier rats out Adapa. Anu summons Adapa, but before Adapa gets to heaven, Anki steps in and gives advice. What Anki is always known to do, trying to help the humans, you know what I mean? Or is he? Anki tells him, first, adopt a mourning posture. Wear dirty clothes and keep yourself unkempt. You will meet a couple of guides when you get there. When they ask you who you are mourning, you tell them that you're mourning for Demuzi and Ningish Zita. Enki also says you will be offered the food and the water of death. You must not eat or drink of it. You will also be offered oil and clean clothing. Of these things you may accept. Adapa gets to heaven and heeds Enki's advice. Things are going favorable by the time that Adapa meets Anu. Anu asks, what happened to the south wind? Adapa fesses up and he says, it blew my boat over in a fit of rage. I cursed it, but I really didn't mean to. I didn't mean to stop the wind from blowing. Anu, he kind of respects him. He's already being looked upon in favor because of the fact that he is mourning Demuzi in Ningish Zita. And he's kind of like, all right, all right, man, that's cool. Thanks for fessing up to it. Since you came all this way, here, have some of this food of life and water of life. And here's a fresh pair of clothes and some oil to anoint yourself with. Now, Adapa, heeding Enki's words, took the clothing and the oil, but stayed away from the food and water of life, as Anu put it. Anu, seeing this, says to Adapa, stupid human, so you will not be immortal? Then go back to Earth. Adapa returns to Earth, and this is basically the end of the text. If Adapa were to receive the food and water of life, he would have stayed in the heavens with Anu. I mean, I don't know, but from reading it, that's the way it seems, right? In this story, immortality is not all it's cracked up to be. Now, remember earlier I said that I would talk to someone from the Kiowa tribe? And this is what they said to me, that he understands why I would use the face of a coyote in my videos, because, you know, basically, I wouldn't know any better. <laughs> but from his people, they know exactly what coyote looks like and coyote's face looks more like. He goes on to say that he is a trickster. He walks on two legs. The phrase coyote in Kiowa is also synonymous with traveling or being a traveler and a wheeler dealer type person. So I think that is super, super, super interesting. I mean, seriously, it's it's freaking fascinating when you think about it. Even today, the word coyote is used. They're the traffickers that are running people from Mexico into the United States. They help people travel and they trick them many, many times. It's interesting, isn't it? Other parallels between the Navajo creation myth and the Sumerian myths of Adapa is that before the flood, it doesn't say that they live forever. In fact, you know that they are not exactly immortal, but people live for an extremely long amount of time. In the blue world, on the 24th night, they upset the chief and he tells them that they have to leave, but he also reminds them that this is a hard land. This is a land where there is not much food. You will not last here forever. And I know I'm reaching far in here. What if the blue world is the frozen world? So basically, I kind of had two realizations after these two videos. One, no, we did this all ourselves. We figured this out. We didn't have aliens help us. Then I read some of the Sumerian texts and then I get, you know, messages from people from different Native American tribes that I think, shit, maybe they did come and help us. That's number one. Number two, is that when we see the fish people and when we see the coyote man, we keep thinking that this is some kind of monster, kind of like Barassus thought by the time 200, the knowledge of what the fish man meant had already been lost. But this is actually a person. In fact, Anu calls 
adapt a, a human. He calls him a stupid human and sends him back down to earth. We know at that point in time, now Adapa is human. He will die just like the rest of us. This one is kind of one of those videos where I mash some stuff up and I go on forever. If you're still watching, hey, thanks for watching and you guys have yourselves a very great day.